night. Howdy, it's good to see everybody. Um, Steve Toth, as you know, was in the Philippines, and he'll tell you the story uh, for going on seven months hereabouts. And uh, that's a long time to be gone. And we normally give our missionaries a, an opportunity to report back on the things that uh, God has done while they're over there. And, you know, sometimes it, you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, you know, whatever. But when you're gone for seven months, you need a little bit longer than, you know, just 10 minutes on a Sunday morning. And so we wanted to give some dedicated time for Steve to really uh, share with us the things that God has done. Uh, just so you know, uh, this weekend, of course, we have our normal uh, round, uh, luncheon and roundtable. I'll say more about that later on. But the really the focus of that roundtable is on missions. Steve gets an extended time to share here tonight. Uh, we have some guest missionaries that will be with us Sunday morning. The Mark and Terry will be sharing as well. Um, during that roundtable time, I'll let you know about some of the things that God is going to be doing and has done in the case of our guest missionaries in Brazil, but Mark and uh, Terry in, in Cuba that's coming up. Um, but there's a lot of things going on around the world, and we need to be aware of that. We need to know how to pray, and that's just a, you know, another way for us to um, be involved, if nothing else, through our prayers. Uh, we're told to make disciples of all the nations, and so there's a lot of people out there doing that. It's hard to participate if we don't know, and so that's, that's really what that's all about. So anyway, enough of me yammering on. Um, Steve, why don't you come up here and, and uh, share with us what was going on in the Philippines? If I'm a little incoherent, uh, please excuse me. Uh, I had a procedure this morning that put me under, you know, for at the hospital, and I, I may have some leftover results of that. So <laughs> if I don't make sense, then you, uh, that's my excuse anyway. <laughs> okay. Well, what I, I, it was very difficult for me to try to put together what I wanted to say to you, because I wanted to focus on the Lord and what the Lord has done in the Philippines, but it's very difficult to do that without talking about the things that we're doing in the Philippines. So what I'd like to do is before starting, I'd like to do two things. I'd like to make sure that everybody understands that the work that we're doing in the Philippines is the work of the Lord. It is not what we are doing, not what I am doing. I am nothing more than an implement in his hand. He is the one that's orchestrating it all. He's the one that's making it possible. He's the one that's providing, and he's the one that's leading and defining the project. If he decides that we stop tomorrow, we're going to stop tomorrow. If he decides that we stop whenever we have to stop, we stop then. So it's up to him. It is his project and not mine. Uh, unfortunately, because of the time constraints, I will not have a whole lot of time to focus on that part of the message. That's why I put it up front. What I'd like to do also is because it, it is such a difficult topic, I'd like to pray for a minute uh, as we start the presentation. And Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to share the work that you do with everybody here in the church. I thank you, Lord, for all the support that you have provided. I thank you, Lord, for the salvation that you've given us. And I pray, Lord, that you open our hearts. I pray, Lord, that you open our minds. I pray, Lord, that you open our eyes to the opportunities that you make for us, the divine appointments to share Jesus Christ with everybody we meet. In his name I pray this, amen. Now, you might be wondering what this is. Why am I walking around with this little thing? Well, let me tell you a story behind it, and, and I think it's very important because missionaries are highly regarded. You know, sometimes in this country, we kind of make fun of missionaries. Sometimes in this country, we, we don't pay enough attention to it. Well, I was giving a, um, I, I was talking one Sunday at a church, and that happened to be the Sunday that the children gave every pastor a gift. And since I happened to be at the church, they gave me a gift too, like all the others. And they gave it to me as their missionary. So I just wanted to tell you that it is really appreciated. It is a blessing to the receiver. 
and it is a blessing to the giver. This trip has been the most, I, I'll tell you, I'm blessed. I, as I was going through the pictures, I was nearly crying. It was so good. So let's get started briefly. Uh, we got a lot of material to cover. The, the presentation has three parts. The first part, I'm gonna tell you about the Philippines. You may not be familiar with the Philippines. Let me get the paper out. That way I don't have to look behind me. Okay, can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Uh, I'm not sure how these mics work and you know, with my hearing, it's, I don't think anyone can hear me because I can't hear anyone else. Um, but seriously, uh, you probably don't know much about the Philippines, so I thought I'd spend uh, just a few minutes telling you about the Philippines before we get started because that's important. Okay, it is, uh, here's the map of the Philippines. You'll see it's in the, kind of in the middle of the Pacific Ocean near Southeast Asia, um, a long ways from America, South America, and all that. Now we're gonna zoom in on the Philippines themselves on the next slide, and you'll see the Philippines is a whole bunch of islands. Now remember, we're looking at the whole world, and now we're just looking at that little dot in the world. And actually, we're going to go Zoom in now on that little rectangle, and I have to figure out how to use the, the no, that's not the one, which is the, is this one? No, that's the wrong one. Oh, I want to do the uh, laser. Oh, the laser? Yeah. Uh, oh, the pointer. The pointer. Can we go back? Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. Okay. So what we're doing is we're looking at this little rectangle here, and that's expanded even further. Now, if you look at that, you'll see this little red triangle-like thing. Well, my mission was to run around that triangle. Boom, just keep going, round and round in a circle. That's all I have seen of the Philippines. I have seen no more. I could not get off the bus as I was traveling from point to point because I couldn't get back on. So I am not going to tell you about the beauties of the Philippines, and there are wonderful things there, but I cannot give you a good travelogue. But <laughs> I can tell you a little bit about the Philippines themselves. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, let's see, which is a slide mover? Okay, there you go. Uh, the Philippines is literally on the opposite side of the globe. There's a 14-hour difference between them and us. They're on the other side of the date line, so they're a day ahead of us. Coming back, you almost come back earlier than you left. Not quite, but almost get here before you left, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, now, the Philippines has 7,000 islands. It's a country of 7,000 islands, of which 3,000 are not even named. It's pretty fascinating. I didn't realize that until I started looking it up. So it's, it's really a, a nation of islands, but there's some very interesting things that I did want to share with you. Uh, the people are growing at 2% per year. That's the population is growing at 2% per year. Three times the rate of America's gr population growth. God is blessing them because children are a blessing from the Lord. Um, actually, I'm gonna skip down to the GDP the GDP is 7% per year, which happens to be three times our official GDP, which is actually inflated. So they're doing something right, and the Lord is blessing them. And I believe the Lord is blessing them because they call upon the name of the Lord. They call upon the name of the Lord regularly. Sometimes it's misguided, don't get me wrong, but they do call upon the name of the Lord. They do believe. They are hungry for the word, and they are hungry for Jesus. Now, one of the interesting challenges of the Philippines is they have 100 languages that they speak. Basically, kind of a language per island kind of deal. You know, each island kind of developed its own language. And the languages are kind of the same and kind of different. It's very confusing to me because sometimes one word means yes in one language, it means no in the other language. So I never know what I'm learning. I have finally decided I'm just gonna learn one language and that's it. And that language is what I, but we'll talk about that in a minute. The official language is Tagalog. Tagalog, that's how you pronounce it. That's the official language. And English is the second, what I'll call their second language equivalent to our Spanish. Everybody, uh, certainly if you're educated, and uh, everybody speaks English, 
and exporting laborers, uh, workers to other countries, a big industry. So the schools make a point of teaching English to everybody. And they, by the way, they love Americans. They love Americans. They, they, they think Americans are the greatest in the world because we give them their freedom. And they didn't have to fight for it. We just gave it to them. The only country in the world that's ever done that. Pretty neat. Anyway, um, one of the things that's interesting about the Philippines, everybody accepts the fact that there is political corruption. It's a fact of life. But when I listen to their news, read their newspaper, listen to their TV, it's no different from ours. The only difference is we pretend that there is no corruption and we don't accept it, but they accept it and they live with it. So they're facing reality in that sense. Um, uh, the religious affiliations, it is 85% Roman Catholic, roughly. Now, Roman Catholic is not Roman Catholic as you know it here. Roman Catholic is a mixture of Roman Catholicism, animism, and, and everything else that's been there. So it's, it's a, a hodgepodge of stuff. It's not, not the Roman Catholicism that you know here. 5% are evangelical, and that's the fastest growing segment of the population. 5% uh, are Muslim. Uh, they're down in the southern part of, of uh, Mindanao, the southern part of uh, the nation, and of course there's a lot of strife down there. And 5% are Buddhists and, and atheists and whatnot. That's, that's the population. Now the population is very open to the gospel. Many times I'm riding on a tricycle, I'm riding on a bus, and somebody asks me about God. Many times. Uh, they, uh, it goes like this. What do you, uh, you know, where are you from? From, the, from Texas. I don't tell them America. I'm ashamed of America. Texas. <laughs> I'm from Texas. Oh, you're from, what are you doing here? I'm teaching the Bible. Oh, you're teaching the Bible. And then they start talking about God. And it's an opportunity to share Jesus Christ. It, everybody is interested in the Lord. Uh, so that's fascinating. But wherever there's the word being preached or talked about, there's false re religions. And the Philippines is very well known for that. Iglesia ni Cristo and Quiboloy are the classic ones. Both of those guys, the leaders of both of those churches, quote unquote, claim to be the Messiah. Not Jesus Christ. They are the Messiah. And they have millions of followers. And they have lots of money. Iglesia ni Cristo, I don't have a picture of it, but they, their churches are like the Catholic cathedrals in Europe. Huge, beautiful, expensive. Um, of course, the Mormons, Seventh-day Adventists, and all those guys are active there too, but not much fruit. They're not bearing much fruit. Let's go to the next slide. I guess I can, I can do that, can I? Now, idols abound. One of the things I said, it is Roman Catholicism, but there's a problem. Every, th this idol here, uh, right here, happy birthday, Mama Mary. Every town has a patron saint. The patron saint is effectively worship. They have a festival for the patron saint. Art, that happens to be a sign in Burungam where I live. That sign is on the building year round. Happy birthday, Mama Mary. There's a sign for the Pope. Uh, this is a picture of the Pope in my hotel that I stay in sometimes. I took the picture because I thought it was funny. What is this, one of those cardboard cutout things, you know? <laughs> and, and it has a stick behind it. And if you look closely, it looks like he has a mustache. You notice he's got a mustache? Well, the reason he has a mustache is because they have, they have to hold him to the stick and they just have him to tie the rope by his mouth. But I thought that was an interesting picture and it really does say something. Pictures of the Pope are all over the place. There's one picture in Burungan, a big, big poster, big, big poster. To His Holiness the Pope. I thought there was only one who's holy, and that's God. But His Holiness the Pope. This picture here is a shrine in the hotel. You will find a shrine or an idol in every vehicle, in every building, in every business. Oh, not just one shrine, but you will find Tons and tons of shrines. And there's actually a collection box there, and people put money in it. So, you know, it's, there's a lot of religious hunger, 
and a lot of misplaced religion in the Philippines. So there's a lot of need for the kind of work that we're doing. Now, uh, next slide. Uh, oh gosh, is this it? No, no, I really messed you up. What did I do? I turned you off? Okay, I, I'm gonna just put this down <laughs> before I blow up your computer like mine. Um, next slide, let's go to the next slide. We did that one. We did that one. We did the next one almost. Okay, now the area where I, the region of the Visa of, of Philippines where I was working is called the Eastern Visayas. There are uh, 13 regions in the country, and that was called the Eastern Visayas. Now that region of the country where I was staying is a combination of Warai people, Cebuano, and other. Uh, tribes, I, I don't know what you want to call it. Uh, tribes is as good as any I, I can think of. Uh, very interesting, the word Warai means nothing. So these people call themselves the Warai Warai, the nothing, nothing people. Now how would you like to be called the nothing, nothing people? Uh, I don't know. It's, it, it, that's one of the reasons I ended up in the Philippines is because uh, there was an AG missionary that came to our church about 15 years ago, and he talked about the Wadai people that had nothing, nothing. And he said he doesn't need any money. He needs nothing, no money, but he needs me to go. And Debbie and I went, and now this is the follow-up to that. Uh, it's mostly subsistence work, uh, mostly farming, fishing, and small micro-businesses. Micro-businesses are like the business on a cart. You, you, know, you know, you've seen those. Those are micro businesses, stuff like that. The little stores that are like 15 feet by 15 feet, uh, those are micro businesses. It happens to be part of Typhoon Alley. And uh, you have a list of typhoons that came through 2013, 2015, and 2016. I was there 2015. Interestingly enough, and I tell you, the Lord is good. The Lord is awesome. He kept me safe the whole time. 2015, I left one week before Ruby hit. And Ruby hit right dead center where my house is located on the beach. So I'll tell you, he, he watches out. He, he watches out for his folks. Um, the dominant mood of the people, I really love the Filipino people. I just love the people. The more I get to know them, the more I fall in love with them. Uh, they, they're, they're joyful people. I don't think you will ever find a Filipino that's not smiling. He may be in total agony, but he is smiling. It's just something about them. They have this joy about them, this peace. And I think that comes from the Lord. I come to America, everybody is uptight, tense, ah, 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 rush, rush, rush. None of that in the Philippines. They have nothing, but they have peace from the Lord. So we have everything, but we have no peace from the Lord. Um, they're determined. Typhoon comes, fine. Blew away our house, fine. We'll rebuild it and start again. You know, that's, that's their attitude. That's their attitude. O obviously, when you have something like Yolanda come and kills 10,000 people, that's a, that's, that's a different beast, but that's what they do. They're very smart, very resourceful, and they're good workers. Resourceful, I have to really emphasize. They're, they're amazing people. They can make anything work. There is nothing that they can't make work. They do everything. OK, I'll give you an example, then I'll move on. Toilets, real simple. OK, toilets. Toilets are, everything's concrete floor, and the toilets are concreted to the floor. So you can't unscrew them, just lift them up like we do here. You know, real easy repair. But they don't have any tools for breaking concrete. You know what they use? Nails, concrete nails. They chip concrete with concrete nails. They can make anything work. They have repair shops for fans. They can take, they took my phone. It blew up in the Philippines. They fixed it. 20 bucks, new battery, fixed the iPhone. No problems. Wonderful. So that's, that's the Filipino mentality. And it, it's really, I, I don't even know the word, encouraging. It really is an encouraging environment to live in. Now we're going to have a couple, a little fun. I want to show you a couple of photographs before we get into the second part. It is the land of bananas. I don't know if any of you has ever seen a banana flower. 
I have never seen a banana flower before, but it sure looks, I'm not going to say anything about it, just look at it. Uh, it's a pretty strange flower. Okay, it is the land of bananas. They have all the bananas are little bananas. They come in uh, green, yellow, red, purple, all kinds of colors. They're sweet and tangy. They make our bananas seem like plastic. <laughs> okay, this is my home away from home. As you can see, there's a road sign. That's Center Christian College. Now, in that center of Christian College, the reason I had to put that sign up is so I could find the house. Because <laughs> the house is set way back, and I'm driving along in the Jeep, and, and I can't see the house because I can't see anything. So I put the sign up, and when I see the sign, I just yell to the driver, stop. Before that, I had to put a red flashing light. I actually built a little red flashing light, you know, so at night I could see where I'm supposed to get off the bus. Otherwise. A couple times, uh, I've ended up a mile down the road and had to walk back with all my books and bags and everything, and I didn't like doing that. Um, I live in the top floor of that building. Um, well, right here in the front room, right there, is where I live. The first floor is an open space, and we hold church there. Uh, one of my foster friends started a church this year, and he holds church there. He has about 40 members. They meet twice a week downstairs. And uh, it is now a church slash residence. It's really awesome. And, you know, I've talked with, talked at the church and so on, taught them. So let's go on to the next one. Now, I told you there are 100 languages. I'm not going to try to teach you all. But I would like to practice a little bit. Um, and I thought this is a good, good lesson. When we come to church, often we say, God is good. All the time. Okay, now we're going to do that in what I. Okay? And the, I'm going to say, Maupai na Dios. And you're going to say, Tanan na Panahon. Tanan na Panahon. Okay, here we go. You ready? My pai na Dios. Tana na panahon. Now you're fluent. <laughs> All right. So that's kind of the end of my uh, Philippines background. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, we can talk about, I can answer questions later on. I'm going to get a little more serious in the next section. Uh, so let's get started on that. First, I'd like to remind everyone of the Great Commission because that's why I'm there. And that's why you're here. That is our mission, our purpose in life here on earth. The Great Commission. And what is it? Go, make disciples, baptize, and teach. We are all instructed to do that. We can't all do all of them. We all have our special functions. We all have our special skills. God has designed a, for each one of us a plan to do good works, and it is our job to do those good works, but they all fall into this command. But the good part is, and the part I would like to emphasize, is behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We don't do it by ourselves. In fact, we can't do it by ourselves. We can't do it without Jesus Christ. Without him, we can do nothing. And I would like to emphasize that everything I'm going to tell you is God's work. It is not my work. He has worked miracle upon miracle. He has answered prayer after prayer. And he does that for you as well as for me. You don't have to go to the Philippines for that. He does it here. He may not answer the prayer the way you want it answered, but he does answer the prayer. So that's very important. Now, I, I want to give you one quick example, a quick testimony. One of the things that, because of my schedule, I really can't get sick. Each class takes about 10 weeks. Two classes is 20 weeks plus a little bit extra, 24 weeks. That's half a year right there. Does not give me a whole lot of time for travel, for relaxation, or anything else. In fact, I can't. I haven't had a vacation over there. But that's not the point. The point is 
that because of that, I pray daily to the Lord to keep me healthy so I can finish his work. Not so that I feel healthy, not for my sake, but I want to finish his work and get it done on his time frame. And I can't do that if I'm sick. I get a stomach ache, the runs or whatever, I am out for two weeks. That's two weeks of classes missed. People do not learn about the Lord. I can't afford to do that. So I pray regularly, Lord, keep me healthy. And he kept me healthy the whole time. Two days after I came to America, I got sick as a dog. And it took me two weeks to get healthy. So I know he answers prayer. That's my personal testimony on that. Now, let's go to the next slide. I want to introduce you to some of the people that I've been working with. These are my host missionaries. Host missionaries, I'm there working with them. They've been there for 30 years. They've spent their uh, an almost entire professional life in, in the Philippines. They are members of Assemblies of God. Uh, when they came to our church, I, we, attend, we were attending Assemblies of God Church. That's how we hooked up with them. Uh, and they've been serving the people on, on the islands of Samar and Leyte for 30 years. When uh, Hurricane, now here, here's how the Lord watches out for his people. They live right on the shoreline in Tacloban, which is the bullseye for Hurricane Haya, uh, Typhoon Haiyan, Yolanda. 17,000 people died in that. 18 feet of water covered the city. And they lived on the shore right where the storm hit. You know what happened to them? A month before the storm hit, they were asked to go to Manila. And they weathered the storm in Manila. Of course, their house got destroyed, completely destroyed. There's nothing left. So now they're pastoring a church, a Chinese church in Manila. But if they're pastoring a Chinese church in Manila, there's nobody to continue their work in uh, Samar and Leyte. And that is what I'm doing. But it's interesting how the Lord brought me there 15 years ago to set things up. Anyway, their calling is evangelism and church planting, church strengthening and support, training of national workers for Christ. This is straight off their uh, bio sheet. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about Assemblies of God, very important, uh, in the Philippines in particular, in the Philippines in particular. Um, their goal is to plant 2,500 churches by 2025. That's 10 years. That's 250 churches a year. Their goal is to have a church in every village because commu commuting is hard. You have to be able to walk to your church. There should be a church in every village so everybody can hear the word. And they would like to have a school in every church. I'm not sure that's practical, but that would, that, that's their hope. They are, as far as I can tell, the most aggressive church planters in all of the Philippines. Uh, they, they plant more churches than anybody, everybody else combined. But uh, anyway, I'm not advertising for AG. I'm just kind of trying to set the, the, ground, uh, the framework. So what am I doing there? Good question. Well, I turned their mission statement upside down. I said that before we can go out, and I said that the first thing we have to do is we have to train people to go out. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the missionaries went out and planted churches. 100 years ago, missionaries went out and planted churches. It's not like that anymore. The missionaries are there to support the locals who can plant churches quick, more, quick, more quickly, more cheaply, and more efficiently than we can. They don't have to learn the language. They know the people. They know the customs. They can blend in. They can move out, and they know when, to plan, when, to, when and how to plant churches. So, okay, how do they plant churches? You've got to train them. So the first thing we have to do is we have to train the nationals so that they can do the Great Commission. Training, mission number one. Once that's done and a church is established, Unless the church is supported, just like an infant, just like a baby, you got to feed the baby, you got to change the diaper, you got to do all that stuff. The church doesn't survive without support for a little while until it grows up and can feed itself. So 
You have to strengthen the churches. You have to provide for them until they can stand on their own feet. That's very important. There, you don't, well, I don't know about here, but I can tell you many, many churches in the Philippines, they plant a church, they don't provide the support. Two or three year, years later, the pastor says, you know, I don't have any money. I can't feed my kids. I can't feed my family. I cannot afford to do this. I have to make a living. And the church dies. So you have to support the church. Okay? And once you've done that, if you're going to grow the kingdom, what are you going to do? You're going to plant more churches. What does a fruitful tree do? It spreads seed everywhere. Some of the seed grows, some doesn't, but it spreads seed. If a tree is not fruitful, a tree is not healthy, it doesn't spread seed. And it ultimately just dies. Our church is like that tree. We have to spread the seed. We have to spread the word. That means that we have to do evangelism and church planting. Not we, the locals, they have to take the lead and we support them. But that's our thing. And sometimes there are disasters and disaster recovery is always in the picture, but I fortunately I've not had to do much of that. Now I have um, outlined some things here that we're doing. Uh, the training of National Workers for Christ is Net Center Christian College. We're going to spend a little bit of time on Net Center Christian College and what, what that does and how it works. It's because I think it is very important for the future of the church. I think it is the model that the church, or the shape of the church to come, certainly in Asia. Uh, we also have some activities that I'll talk about, church strengthening and support. Uh, basically, I've been working with the district and all kinds, not just AG, uh, I've been working with uh, many denominations and providing uh, seminars and, and training, practical training and so on, uh, and livelihood initiatives. We'll talk about some of those. Okay, um, intentional moves, we'll talk about that later. Okay, let's talk about Net Center Christian College. I'm trying to move along because I know I have limited time. We're not even going to get to the slides, I fear. Um, Net Center Christian College, it has uh, two elements to it. One for church leaders. For church leaders, we have the Exhorter Certificate Program that we initiated. It's a Bible college on wheels, effectively. Uh, it's a four-year pastoral program. At the end, uh, the um, graduates will be equipped to pastor a church. In the meantime, they're equipped to evangelize and lead and spread the word. We are partnering with ICI materials, uh, uh, with ICI for materials, that's textbooks and stuff. I brought some materials for you, for you to look at if you're interested afterwards. Uh, I can show you that. Uh, it is free to students. One of the things is they don't have money. I have one class where the students could not pay the money to travel to the class. They had to be reimbursed by other students to do that because we as a college don't do that. So cost is a real issue. It has to be free to the students. They could not afford to do it. And of course, now think about it. What's the alternative to a Bible college on wheels? The Bible college comes to your hometown and they teach you the Bible. What's the alternative? You go off to Bible college. For four years, you're going to leave your hometown, you're going to leave your family. It ain't going to happen. It's too expensive, too long, too difficult. The training doesn't get done. The only way the training gets done is by coming to you. It's kind of the Philippine version of Phoenix University, if you can kind of, you can grasp that. Uh, it is uh, coupled with field work. Our students go out and evangelize and plant churches, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, as far as I can tell, it is really hard to coordinate, well, to directly associate church plants with Net Center Christian College, because we don't do that. The local churches do that. But our students have led 15 church plants in the last year. 15 that I was able to count. So it's, it works, it's fruitful. Now, just as I, I share, wanted to share some statistics with you, uh, in two years, we have 300 registered students. We have conducted 25 
classes, each class in a different location. We have awarded 174 class certificates, and we have five active teachers as I speak, teaching in different locations. This is not my work. I had nothing to do with that. That's all God's work. The people come to us asking for this. He is bringing them to us. We're not pushing. This is God's work. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the next slide, but I just wanted you to read, if you can, the syllabus, just so you kind of get an idea of the material we cover. Uh, introduction to Pentecostal doctrine, local church and evangelism. Notice number two, local church and evangelism. I intentionally put that as the second course. The first course teaches you about Christianity, about Jesus Christ and God and the faith. The second course teaches you to go out and share that faith. That's the idea. The third course talks about the most important tool, most powerful tool we have, which is prayer and worship. And then we got into the New Testament survey. We finished that this year. Next year is Old Testament survey and introduction to hermeneutics. And the last year will be introduction to homiletics and apologetics. So this is going to be an interesting two years coming up. Now, for each one of those courses, just so you know, we have to have a textbook. We have to create teacher handouts and student handouts. We have to conduct tests and provide tests and record the results and do all that administrative stuff. And we have to have teachers and organizers and administrators. All of that is wrapped into that Center Christian College. So I can share some of those documents with you if you want to see them later. Now, the other part of the, the issue is, great, you go out and you tell someone about Jesus Christ and he accepts Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. What happens next? He goes home. He thinks about it. What did I do today? What did I just do? What decision did I make? You know, he starts thinking about it. Now, unless you follow up and unless you support that person, unless you bring him into the family, so to speak, he will wander away. The pressures of life and all the other distractions will pull him away. So it's very important, once you bring someone to Jesus Christ, to continue the process of growth. And that's what this does. This is what I would, initially it started out as a uh, new believers course. It can also be used for evangelizing. But it is basically designed for church members and prospects to get to know Jesus better. And it's the Intentional Moves program. It's a one-year program. It's a small group study thing, which is great for us because at the college, we don't have to provide the teachers. And what's nice about it is we, we, we don't even have to pay for it because the students can afford to pay for it. I'll explain that in a minute. And uh, the way it works is uh, they can't afford to buy a book. The book is 55 pesos. 55 pesos is about a buck ten. It's 45 pesos to the dollar, yeah, give or take. 55 pesos is one book. They need four books, so you're talking about 220 pesos. They can't afford it. They don't have it. 250 pesos is a day's wages for a laborer, just to give you a reference point. So we decided that we would offer them the 10 peso plan. The 10 peso plan, I, I, it's really cool. Every time they come to class, they drop 10 pesos in the kitty. And over 26 weeks, they will have collected 260, well, 52, 520 pesos, right? <coughs> now, 260 of it goes for books, because I take a cut for the college. 260 of it goes for books. The other 260 goes for a party. So they like that, and it's only 10 pesos per week. And they can afford 10 pesos per week. So that's been very popular. And no money out of pocket, but th th that's a cool program. We have about 800 participants to that program right now. 
that have signed up. So it's uh, been well received. We also do ministerial continuing education program seminars. One of the things that happen in the Philippines is uh, there was, there's been a split in the AG structure. This is, uh, this is just background right now, okay? There's been a split in the AG structure. The two guys at the top, the, uh, the superintendent and the assistant superintendent couldn't get along, you know, and they argued, and then and finally they, one went one way, the other went the other way, and they're still arguing. It's kind of a divorce-like thing. But uh, there's been a split, and the other day, and then one day uh, they asked me, hey, would you like to do a seminar on conflict resolution? <laughs> what an opportunity. Okay, that's time to quit. That's, that's my alarm to quit. It's five minutes. Okay. Um, I'll t I don't, tell me when. I, I'll finish this, and then uh, we'll stop for a minute. So that gave me an opportunity. I put together a four-hour seminar and gave it to them, including the superintendent of the district. And I didn't mince any words. I said, okay, now apply this to the AG split. All the, all, all the pastors agreed, you know, but, but anyway, it was interesting. But that's the kind of stuff that we do. No, not yet. There were, I'm working on it. We're working on it. But I, uh, it's, it's going to be hard. I think, I think it's going to be hard. Uh, we have uh, members in both classes, uh, both sides. You know, I, I, don't, I work with everybody, not just AG. Uh, as you'll see from some of the pictures, I actually work with Calvary Chapel there. I go to Calvary Chapel Church there. I do, I do want to share those pictures with you sometime. Um, next year, we're going to do church administration and financial management. I, I was thinking about this, and I'm looking at these guys. Here's a pastor. He's going to be handling money. Money goes in one pocket, goes out of the other pocket, gets commingled with his personal funds. He doesn't know how to keep books. We got a problem. So I, I think they need some training in administration and financial management. That's next year's uh, thrust. So that's the training part. Well, now we're going to talk a little bit about the support activities. And I call that the Philippine Missionaries. That's the name of, uh, I, I just picked that as my name for the Amer state side. And what we're doing right now, these are all ongoing projects I'm going to talk to you about. These are all ongoing projects. First, pastoral support, personal tutoring, mentoring, and encouragement and funding. Livelihood initiatives, I will address each one briefly. Church planting and construction, we do that. Evangelization and outreach, I wish I could do more. I'm looking for help. Uh, supplies, Bibles, tracts, books, and computers. Uh, we'll talk about each one of those. Now, on the right-hand side, just as a point of interest, I hope you can read it. I have to make it small because there were so many items to put in there. I kind of grouped the stuff that we got going. Church construction, we have two issues. Bagakai church building. There's a, Bagakai is in the mountains of Samar Island. It is so remote that there's no cell phone coverage. If you want to talk to the pastor, you have to take a four hour bus ride to get to him. That's, that's how remote he is. Some parts, you can't even take a vehicle. Some parts, you have to walk. They invited me to one of the villages up there this summer. And they said, would you like to come with us for an outreach? I said, sure, that sounds like fun. Oh, you have to go across seven rivers. Oh, OK, well, maybe I can do that. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, you have to hike 20 kilometers to get there. Uh, I accepted, but then I had to turn it down because I didn't think I could make it. 20 kilometers. You cannot take a motorbike there. You can you know, I, I wasn't sure if I could take, you know, my, with my health, I didn't want to take the chance. I cannot risk the college to do that. So I did not go. But that's the kind of areas we're working in. And uh, we started building a church. I, I've got some pictures of where it is right now. We laid the foundation. Then we had to put a hold on it because of land dispute issues that we're trying to resolve. And when, as soon as that's resolved, we're going to finish the church. Uh, then Dolores. Now, Dolores, is, this is really big, heavy on my heart, and I have to share with you Dolores. Dolores is a beautiful church 
it's, uh, it's got 50 members or thereabouts, 30 to 50 members, families. And the way they work in the Philippines, you've got the road, and you kind of build a house, you know, as close to the road as you can. The road is your front yard. The kids play in the road. The dogs sleep in the road. The, the road is your front yard. And the church is, and I'll show you some pictures, is maybe uh, five feet from the road. Well, the state has now decided that they need a 15-foot easement. What are they going to do? They're going to bring a bulldozer and just knock the building down. Just that's it in June. They're just going to knock the whole building down because it's encroaching on the road. They're not going to reimburse them. They don't do that. I can show you pictures of what it looks like after they knock part of a building down. It's not a pretty sight. So at the bottom line is we really need some help in relocating that church. The uh, issue is the pastor can't afford to buy land. The pastor can't afford to rent. How, where does he go? How, what happens to the church? Goes away. We don't want that. Livelihood initiatives. Uh, Pastor Romy is in Bagakai. He's moving right now. Now this guy, I got to talk to you about Pastor Romy. I love Pastor Romy. This is a guy that lives in Toft, and he wants to plant a church in Bagakai. It's a three-hour bus ride. Okay, every week. He goes Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday to Bagakai and comes back. And I did that trip with him numerous times. And his hobby is street preaching. Okay? Numerous times he's asked me to street preach on the bus. Numerous times I have rejected him. <laughs> I did not want to do it. I just... Besides, I speak English, you know, and these are all locals that speak what I or whatever. I, you know, this would not be effective, and I think it would just annoy them, so I didn't do it. Then on one trip, he decided he was going to do it. So he got up about halfway. We we're, in the, we're in the jungle, and the bus is bouncing around, you know. He gets, stands up and starts preaching. I have no idea what he's saying, but he gets in the zone, you know, his eyes glaze over, and he's just preaching the word. You can just tell he's preaching hell on damnation and all kinds of stuff. He's just preaching away. Everyone's kind of trying to hide. <laughs> just like here, just like here. And ultimately, when he's done, he asked me to hand out the pamphlets. <laughs> so I had to go around the bus and hand out tracts to everybody. That I was willing to do, but I was not willing to street preach. But that is what he loves to do. And he's uh, planting five churches right now, all around Bagakai. All around Bagakai. And he was one of my students. And the reason we're in Bagakai is because he was one of my students. Um, radio ministry, that's an interesting need. What, uh, Pastor Sam used to have a radio ministry. Radio ministry co costs 5,000 pesos per month. That's about 100 bucks um, per month, half hour per week. And then the typhoon came, we had to stop it. And a lot of church planting activities. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about computers, Bibles, and phone load. Computers. You can buy a computer in the Philippines, it's good, but most people can't afford it. And we have used computers in this country coming out years. So if you have a used laptop or something you'd like to donate, fine. If you don't, that's fine. Uh, I have found a source where I can buy some decent computers for under 100 bucks a piece that I can take. Uh, but I think that would be very important for them. Um, Bibles. Nelson uh, provided an offering last year for Bibles. Interestingly enough, we weren't ready to distribute them last year. We distributed them this year on God's timing for five new church plants in the Tacloban area. Last year, they weren't ready for the church plants, but this year they are. So we distributed those Bibles. Bibles are always, always welcome. The other problem that pastors have is I said they have no money. I mean, literally, sometimes their weekly tithes are 250 pesos. That's $5 for a week of tithes for the entire church. That's it. So it's real hard to make a living as a pastor. You don't get to be a millionaire. And uh, because of that, 
they uh, can't afford to pay for the prepaid phone SIM card thing, you know, the, the phone load. They call it load there. I don't know what you call it here. You prepay a, a certain number of minutes and uh, you get to use your phone. So most of the time, they're out of load. You try to call them or you text them, you can't reach them because they're out of load or out of battery. And that's a nice, that's a nice thing because uh, if you can give them something like that, then they can keep in touch with everybody and uh, help manage the church. Clean water is a big problem, but that's way, way in the future. We've tried doing that, and it's just way too expensive. So those are some of the projects that are ongoing. If you're willing to help, fine. But that's really not why I'm asking. Uh, I'm going to go to the next one. The, the next one is this. Going back to the very beginning slide. Go. And make disciples. And baptize and teach. You can do that here. You can do it in the Philippines. You can help with the Philippines. It's okay. The only thing I ask is that you do something. Just do. And the go doesn't mean that you have to travel. I want to make this very clear to everybody. Go does not mean travel. Go means get out of your comfort zone and do something and go. And you know, I guarantee you, I guarantee you the Lord will bless you. The Lord will bless you. So, are you ready to serve the Lord? Just go and do something and let the Lord do the rest for you. And uh, I promise you, I promise you, you will be mightily blessed and you will have the time of your life. There is no better boss in, in this world than the one we serve. No better boss than our Lord. He is the best boss there is, and I can speak to that from personal experience. So that's the end of my thing. Now, I've got a bunch of pictures, but I know I'm running late, so I don't know how to deal with that. I do want to share a video before we quit, if I can do that. Yeah, well